Hey y'all, hope you're doing well. My name is Dave. I'm a senior in the class of 2021 at Walter Johnson High School in North Bethesda, Maryland. And today we're going to be looking back at the history of Peter Franchot. Um, now he's been Maryland's comptroller since 2006. Um, and I think it's nice to look at this right now uh, because he's gearing up for a, a big run at, um, at governor in 2022. And many people are seeing him as the favorite to win. Um, and before I get into this, I want to let y'all know, um, I wrote an article about this. Um, it's written a lot more professionally. This video is going to be recorded. Um, so I'm going to leave a link to that down below. So if you'd rather read that, go ahead down there. It's going to be the same content. Okay. So the only Democrat who got more counties than Peter Franchot did in his 2018 comptroller race was Attorney General uh, Doug Gansler in 2010. And Doug ran unopposed. Um, so that's a little bit of the backstory here for why people think Peter Franchot is going to be so powerful. Um, but where's he come from? So Franchot, he's an army veteran. Uh, he seems to be a craft beer enthusiast. He, uh, he grew up in Massachusetts. Um, you know, he went to school there. Uh, he got his law degree from Northeastern. Uh, he started working for in the 1980s for Congressman Ed Markey. Um, and that brings him down to Maryland. And so he's going to buy a house in Tacoma park. Um, and then in 1986, he runs for uh, the Maryland house of delegates. Um, he's going to hang out there for the next 20 years. He ran in 1988 for Maryland's 8th Congressional District um, and lost badly to the powerful Republican incumbent because this was back before Maryland was quite as Democratic as it is today. Um, so he settled back down in his seat in the House of Delegates for a while. Um, but then 2006. So Francho is mounting up a run for governor. Um, and and the governor's seat is, is this man over here, um, William Schaefer. Um, and he's... He's a powerful incumbent, but he's got some controversy we're going to get into in a sec. Um, and then Janet Owens, who's the uh, county executive for Anne Arundel County, where Annapolis is, um, she's going to get in this race as well. Um, and so Schaefer's going to run into some issues. Um, he's got a lot of controversy going. So it starts, um, the mayor of Baltimore, Martin O'Malley, he's running for governor. Um, and he's running against our incumbent, who's a Republican, who's uh, Bob Ehrlich. Um, and, you know... O'Malley's going to blast Schaefer for his relationship with this Republican for cozying up to him, um, for being close. Um, then Schaefer's going to cost himself a bunch of minority voters when he, after an incident at McDonald's, he exclaims at a Board of Public Works meeting that he wishes, you know, immigrants would speak English. You're in the United States. Uh, goes on a very racist tirade there. Um, so that hurts him. Um, then again, in 2006, February, um, an aide brings him a cup of tea and she walks away and he watches her walk away. Uh, and then he asks her to walk again. Um, and he also comments on the fact that his opponent, Janet Owens, um, she wears long dresses a lot. And he says this makes her look almost like a man. Um, and so he's going to get blasted for all of these controversies and they're really going to, they're really going to play into his, um, you know, play into his downfall here. Um, and so he, he falls all the way down to third place in this primary. Um, and so you can really see along here, Franchot only carries four counties. Uh, he carries along the national capital region here around DC. Um, and with those, you know, just those four counties, he's going to get the win. Um, you know, he has, he has a little bit of second place out in Western Maryland where nobody lives. Um, he has terrible showings really in the Royals. He gets blasted absolutely on the Eastern shore. Um, and he doesn't do well in Baltimore either. Um, so how does he really win? Um, Cause you know, he only wins four counties, but it's because he got such a crazy margin here in Montgomery County, nearby in Prince George's County. He netted something between those two counties. He netted over 50,000 votes over his next opponent. Um, and so that's really all he needs. And so he's going to come, you know, with about 36% of the vote, he's going to win. And then Janet Owens is going to come in second. Um, and Schaefer's going to slide all the way to third with about 29% of the vote. Um, and it's really interesting to note that primary 15 years ago, that's the last truly competitive election that Franchot actually faced. So, Really, over the next few years, he's going to see some some really impressive showings, um, and he's never really going to be challenged again up until you know this upcoming governor's race. And so now here's a here's a look at you know how the next elections look. So in 2006, um, he's going up against uh, a you know a University of Baltimore professor and McCarthy, um, and this is going to be his closest election. Uh, he, you know, he has some close margins. He only wins one county on the Eastern shore. That's Kent County, which is our, still our smallest population county. Um, he wins Anne Arundel County by only 32 votes. Um, his, his strength is really centered here in central Maryland. Um, but that's still enough. And he gets like something like 55, 60% of the vote somewhere in there. 
Um, and then, you know, he builds on this strength. Um, and in 2010, even though it's a, it's a red wave year because it's the Obama midterms. And so there's a lot of, you know, Republican influence coming up. Um, he flips two counties, flips Talbot here. He flips Dorchester here. Um, he continues to grow his strength here in, in central Maryland. Um, he doesn't lose anything. Um, and, you know, he, he just keeps the state moving left. Um, in 2014, or he had considered briefly running for governor and then decided not to, which is probably a good thing because Larry Hogan won. Um, he doesn't flip any new counties, but he keeps building his, his margins under the surface. Um, and he's, he's continuing to grow in influence. Um, and, and, you know, really getting a lot of just respect um, within the state. And there's a lot of people growing, you know, starting to like him a lot more. Um, he's also rebellious. He doesn't do what the Republicans want him to do. He doesn't do what the Democrats want him to do. He does his own thing. Um, so these are some of the big things he does. So he has a massive fight about craft beer. Um, he thinks the industry's got too many regulations. Um, so he sets up a task force that looks at it and they submit a bill to the legislature and in return, the legislature sets up a bill that says Francho does not have the power to regulate uh, or even look into, you know, the craft beer industry. Um, so there's a big fight over that. Um, he's a huge opponent of like slot machines and gambling in Maryland. Uh, he very much opposes that, even though it becomes very popular. Um, and he loses out on that. Um, he fights to uh, keep schools closed until after Labor Day so that we can build up economic revenue. And that's a successful fight because he's got Hogan backing him on that. Um, and he uses his leverage, um, to make sure that Baltimore city and county public schools will install, uh, air conditioning units in all of their schools. Um, which the school boards didn't like the school boards didn't like either of these things. Um, cause it's really, you know, the state taking a lot more influence into them than they really wanted to see. Um, he also just knows what he's doing electorally. So he cozies up with, uh, with Larry Hogan because Larry Hogan's a very popular figure and he wants to make sure he can get things done, even though they're on opposite sides of the aisle. Um, he builds a lot of infrastructure projects um, on the Eastern Shore, including oil pipelines, even when the Democrats, you know, don't like that um, because he knows he's not going to really lose his voters in the key strongholds and he is going to gain no, new voters in rural places. Um, so he's really just just building his coalition through all of this. Um, and he's, he's coming up with all these ideas. He's getting his name out there. He's becoming a very, very popular figure um, within the state. And so because of all this, nobody really wants to take him on. Um, and so even though the Democratic establishment wants him gone, they can't really get anybody to primary him. Um, and on the Republican side, the best they can come up with is Anjali Reid Foucan. Um, and she's got a very interesting past. Um, so she was once a member of the Green Party. She was part of the Occupy Wall Street protests. She still describes herself as a recovering drug addict who leads recovery sessions once a week on the beach. And she was kicked out of Montgomery County Public Schools um, when she was a student there. Um, and despite all of this, she's gonna run, you know, as a Republican against him. Um, and this is probably the most interesting thing about her. So when she meets her voters, she gives them Twizzlers. This is her big thing. She says, they're red with a twist, I'm Republican with a twist. Uh, and that's a little insight into how you know, how much of a, a wonderful candidate she is. Um, the Republicans don't like her too much. So she refuses to back down um, and and denounce the, the National Organization for Women after Republicans ask her to. Um, she never really, you know, wants to support Donald Trump. She, she publicly says she doesn't fully support him. Um, she is a Buddhist. She is, an, uh, you know, uh, a woman of color. Um, and so the, the Republicans don't like this. Um, so in 2014, she ran as a write-in candidate for, for Comptroller. She got a, a remarkable 595 votes in that race. Um, then in 2016, she comes up to Montgomery County. Um, she runs for uh, Sheber Evans' seat in the 4th District on the Montgomery County Board of Education. She loses badly there, too. She gets about 30% of the vote there. Um, and so now she's like, okay, I'm going to move back to Ocean City, um, and I'm going to take on this immensely powerful and popular Franchot uh, for Comptroller. And so this is how that goes for her. Francho flips every county except for three. He wins 21 counties within the state. This is one of the greatest electoral performances by a Democrat in Maryland history. Um, he really just, he just blows her out of the water. He, I mean, he flipped something like 10 counties in this election. You know, it's the, the pretty much the whole Eastern Shore except for Cecil. Um, he's flipping, you know, 
uh, Harford and he's flipping Carroll County. He's flipping Calvert and St. Mary's down here. He even flips Allegheny County out here, which is absurd because Allegheny County is very much Republican country. Um, he just, the whole state loves him. Um, it gets worse if you want to look at actual margins. So here's, here's the margin of the winners over their opponents. And it's really just, it's just Rancho. It's, it is, might as well have been a population map because he's just, you know, you know, he's racking up his, his margins a little more in the center of the state, but that's just because more people live here. Um, you know, if we want to look at uh, down here, if we want to look at the map for where, for Fukan was getting her votes, she gets a little bit in, you know, Baltimore County. She's doing better in Anne Arundel a little bit. Um, I guess, you know, Montgomery and Howard to an extent because more people live there and a little bit across Northern Maryland. But it, all in all, she she's not just getting that many votes at all. Um, and up here for Francho, you know, he blows her out of the water so much in these central states, central counties, that the the, um, the rurals might not, might as well as not existed. Um, and he, he wins this election by over a million votes. Um, he gets like well over 70% of the, of the vote in the election. It's, it's just an absurd showing from Francho in this election. Um, and so this is really why people are seeing Francho as a clear favorite in this governor's race, because he's got this electoral base. And because really, take a look at this. Since 2006, from that 2006 to that 2018 election, here's the way he's made counties swing um, within the state of Maryland. Every single county has come left. Some have come left as much as 30 points. Um, Even Cecil County up here, you know, which has done the least, has still come left a little bit. He's flipped all of these counties down here in purple. Um, Francho really just has run away with this state. And he's very popular. He's getting more and more popular. And this is why people love him and love his chances in this election. Um, so thanks for watching. Here's a look at the places you can look um, if you want to find more research on what I did. Um, I should be doing a more electoral analysis like this, so stay tuned. Uh, be sure to subscribe. Um, you can send me an email at davetoxicalpolitics at gmail.com, and I'll try to get back to you if you have any questions. Um, and yeah, that's all. Have a great day.